Steve Shank has been a friend, a mentor, and a example of pastoral ministry to me for 25 years, and it is a, a particular joy to introduce him to you. I, I was thinking this week as I was planning on introducing him that it's, it's not many pastors that get to introduce their childhood pastor uh, to the, their own home church, but that's what I get to do this morning. Steve led the church that I was a part of during my teenage years. He was instrumental, I think, uh, as maybe no other person beside my parents. Uh, he was instrumental in encouraging me towards pastoral ministry. I'm not sure there's another person more humanly responsible besides my own mom and dad. Uh, to encouraging me, endorsing me towards pastoral ministry. And more than that, he is a man that throughout my life uh, simply is full of faith for what God has called uh, other people to do. It's one of the things I've been grateful for about Steve over the years is to watch really in wonder as he would take a moment to encourage someone that has just uh, taken some action in ministry or stepped out to serve the Lord in some way, and he just has a, a gift to come in that moment and, and be more excited about how God's using you than you were uh, and, and point out things that God was doing in you that you weren't unaware of. Uh, so there's just a gift of faith and encouragement that he brings um, and, and in particular, I, I wanted to uh, bring him to preach to you because I think uh, this church, in many ways, is a fruit of decades and years of that gift of faith. Uh, Steve was on the pastoral team in Phoenix. We were able to be reunited in Phoenix after my pastoral training. We served there for eight years together. And he was one of the men on that team that was behind and encouraging and supporting and praying for and finding ways to send out this church plant team. And as Aaron says, we wouldn't exist without our family of churches starting this church. Well, we definitely wouldn't exist without Steve and the other men on that team having the faith to send out friends, to send out resources, to send out uh, my wife Lori and I, and just to, to invest in the mission, in the gospel, to not think only of their own church and their own resources, but to care about uh, a, a community a thousand miles away. So that really has exemplified Steve throughout his life. He has moved uh, too many times to count to serve gospel mission. He's coming now to us from Nashville. I'm sure he will greet you from our sister church there in Nashville. Uh, but I, I believe it is a, a particularly joyful moment of seeing God's fruitfulness over years of ministry to just enjoy uh, a man who has labored and pastored and invested to now come and see a church that he was instrumental in starting, uh, though he's never been here till this day. So I'm very excited to see God uh, celebrate that. So if you can, uh, welcome Steve. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for preaching. Enjoy and honor this evening. What a privilege, not only to be here with a church, as John said, that we prayed about for many years. I remember before Austin was even the destination of the church plant that John was going to lead, I remember coming here to Austin with John and with Rich to scout out the land, to pray, to seek God, and now to see you as a fulfillment of God's kindness and mercy uh, is a joy to experience. Um, in addition to that, to, to be preaching at a guy's church that I knew when he was eight years old. And when I say I've known him since he was eight, uh, a lot of you have known people when they were eight, but you've, you've never kept in contact with them or you don't know where they are. John and his mom and dad, Pete and Betsy, John's siblings, their family have been intricately a part of our hearts and our families since we first met. Uh, I don't know if a, a month goes by that I don't text or email or talk to his dad, Pete, not only as a pastor of mine, but as a friend. And to stand here at a church that John is now serving with his unusual gifts. I'm having a flood of flashback moments and memories. Uh, and they all represent the goodness of God. 
So it is an... Hi, Lori. I see you over there. Good to see you. Uh, I was a part of their wedding, too. So, man, all kinds of things are coming at me. Let's just have a show and tell. Forget the... No, we won't do that. The only downside of this arrangement... And, and this is not flattery, folks. This I've told John this numerous times. He is, he is one of my favorite expositors and preachers. I have learned how to preach from John. And I have often listened to his sermons, even since he's been here, simply to be fed in my soul. And selfishly, I would rather be listening. But he has asked me, to serve, and so I will do that by God's grace, and it's, it's a joy to do. So thank you for letting me come. A lot of fun. <sighs> Recently, uh, Janice, my wife, and I uh, watched a movie uh, of a family's trial uh, with a very sick child. Uh, the medical world could offer no answers, no solutions, no cures. Uh, and as the movie progressed, the, the suffering of the child increased. And as you can imagine, the, the tension mounts in the movie as you're wondering how all this is going to wind up. And at one moment in the movie, you knew was coming, the heartbroken mother can't stand it anymore and she lets out this lament, why don't you speak? Ever wish God would just speak to you? Especially in your moment of trial? Ever find yourself in circumstances that you never saw coming, you never would have orchestrated for your life? And all you want is some assurance from God that He's there, that He knows what you're going through, that He cares? I have on numerous occasions... Maybe you can relate to comedian Woody Allen, who once said in one, of his mo- in one of his movies, if only God would give me a sign. If he would just speak to me once, anything, a sentence, two words, if he would just cough. In, in 38 years now of pastoral ministry, I've come to this realization that sooner or later, Every Christian goes through patches in their lives so disorienting, so disheartening, so disappointing, that in their hearts they're just hoping God would just cough. The married couple who looks at one another and they never say these words, but they both think it. Where where did our friendship go? The parents whose hearts break as they watch a child that they raised on a path of destruction as they're pursuing the corn husks of life and the world. Or those that live with this cloud of gloom. Exodus 10 talks about a darkness that could be felt and they dread going to bed at night because they know When they wake up, it's going to be there again. This depression that never leaves. Or an interview that doesn't go well and you don't get the job. And all he had to do was speak. And yet it appears he remained silent. This morning we're going to look at a psalm for everyone who has ever wondered, why won't you speak? Why won't he give me some assurance that he knows what I'm going through? Why won't he just cough? A psalm that C.S. Lewis, noted author, poet, literary genius, gave us the Chronicles of Narnia, among other classics, said the following, quote, In my view, this psalm is the greatest poem ever written. In my view, this poem, Psalm is the greatest poem ever written. So if you have your Bibles with me, or with you, turn with me to Psalm 19 or turn your Bibles on, depending upon 
how you read God's word nowadays. And go with me to Psalm 19. We're going to read the entire psalm. We're going to pray and then ask the Lord to help us. Psalm 19, this most extraordinary psalm and remarkable poem. Psalm 19, verse 1. <clears throat> the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving its chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yes, much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins, and let them not have dominion over me. And then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, O Lord, in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Lord, this is your holy and your inerrant and your inspired word. It is living and it is active. We pray this morning that every individual this morning would encounter it living and active to them. And to me, in Jesus' name, amen. Notice how the psalm begins. To the choir master. We don't know if David sat down and deliberately wrote this remarkable poem to address a need in the people of God, or it reflects maybe his personal devotional thoughts out of his devotional time with God. What we do know is this when he got done, he said, Choir master, this one goes into the public hymnal. This one, God's people must reflect upon, read upon, and be familiar with, this one goes to the church. Three points that emerge from this text. Number one, God speaks through his world, or God speaks through his universe. God speaks through his world. Notice in the first six verses all of the speaking language. The heavens declare, the skies proclaim, day to day pours out speech, the nights reveal. Verse 4, their voice goes out in all the earth, their words to the ends of the earth. On and on, there is this language of speech and communication. What's David saying at this point? That the builder of the universe, without words, is speaking always loudly. He is using cosmic sign languages. There is no words. There's no audible speech. And yet there is communication going on and on and on through what he has created. David's assumption in this psalm is this. 
the stars and the moon and the sun and Venus and Jupiter and trillions upon trillions upon trillions of planets in the entire universe, which, by the way, in Psalm 147, verse 4 says, have been assigned an individual name. Imagine this this speaker here was filled with sand. How would you anticipate how many grains of sand were in a container this size? Billions, trillions, quadrillions, whatever's next. And then how many grains of sand do you think are on all the beaches of the planet, that which you see out of the water and that which is under the water hidden? The great Sahara Desert. Think of all the grains of sand that are on the planet. Scientists have taken the weight of sand in a very small piece and then multiplied it by the square inches on the planet and have concluded there are at least 10 times more planets in the universe than there are grains of sand on the earth. And every one of them has an individual name. But he's also saying they all have given, assigned a task, and that is this, to join their silent voices together in one loud communication, one loud proclamation. Someone made us. Someone is directing the path of all planets. David's objective in these first few verses is to encourage God's people to contemplate the glory of God as portrayed by the heavens. And he says there's not one place on earth where you can go and not witness that testimony going on. His speaking through all that he's created of his glory and his splendor and his handiwork. That's why they're there, to draw our attention to the builder of the universe and to listen of his glory and of his magnitude and of his power and of his splendor. When when, when I talk to someone who is getting in angst over the political situation of our country and who's going to be our next president and what's the future of our children going to look like, As gently as I possibly can, I can say, you know what, David wants us to turn off Facebook, turn off our cell phone, take a walk at night, and listen. And be aware of what that is communicating to you, of his power and his awesome sovereign grace and his, his glory. If he knows all of the countless trillions and trillions of names of the planets in the universe, is it possible that he doesn't know yours? Do you think it a difficult thing for him to know that your child is sick? Or your marriage needs help? Or you have a very important exam coming up or that you have a strange lump in your body or that you don't sleep well? or you haven't conceived yet, or you went to bed one more night with gloom, the universe is silently shouting without words of the awesome reality and power and glory and majesty and presence of your creator. They are not just there for astronomers to have a job. They are not just there to inspire nice songs. They are there shouting. They are there proclaiming. They are there declaring and assuring you every single day of his control of all things. Notice in verse 2. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night, look, reveals knowledge. Now, doesn't that seem backwards? 
It seems backwards to me. See, when the sun is up, things are revealed. You don't need your headlights. You can see in front of you. You can mow your lawn. You can go shopping. Every now and then you see flat, you know, clouds. Maybe a vapor trail tells you there's a plane up there. Maybe a distant hill or a mountain. You can see in the day. But when night comes, the, the normal thought is things are concealed. That's why you need lights. You can't see. It's dark. We don't see in the darkness. Ah, but the biblical thinkers, the biblical writers, see it exactly the opposite. They say when the sun goes down and returns to its chamber, something comes on and reveals. It reveals our smallness. It reveals his vastness. And it speaks his glory. Parents are concerned, understandably, how to build a biblical worldview into their children. How, how can I help my child think biblically, think right? Now again, age appropriate, so maybe teenager or something. I'll talk about a two-year-old. But how can I begin to equip my children with a worldview that will help them in their future, regardless of who's president, a future that I won't see? How, how do I do that? Let me tell you how you do that. Number one, you take them out at night and you have them look up and you tell them everything you know about that. Tell them everything that you know that that is declaring, that that is testifying to. After you've done that for a while, you take them to Round Rock Cemetery and you tell them everything you know about that because that's silently declaring things as well. And there you have the bookends of a biblical worldview. There is a God and you will meet him and everything else will fit in between those two bookends. And that is how you set up your, their understanding of a need for a Savior. There is a God, and you will meet Him. Therein is the bookends of a biblical world view. Day by day, over and over and over and over. The world, the universe is assuring us he is speaking and it is speaking of his glory and his power, his omnipotence, his omniscience. God speaks through his world. Number two, God speaks through his word. Verses 7 through 11, David, after pondering the splendor of the heavens, now begins to reflect on something even more glorious because he says things about God's word that he doesn't say about God's creation. It's as if he's saying, look, if you have been mesmerized by the heavens, you haven't seen anything yet. And so he uses these words to describe how God has spoken to us. The law, the testimony, precepts, commands, a, a poetic word of fear, which is a poetic way of describing God's word and rules. David is saying, look, we get even more of an awareness of who God is and what he is like, his wisdom, his love, his truth, his understanding through his word not only is he silently shouting through his creation, but he speaks now through his word. And look how he describes this word. It's perfect, meaning it's complete. You are not at a disadvantage by simply having the Bible. You don't need the Bible and a Google search. You don't need the Bible and Barnes & Noble. To understand God, to know Him, to be moved by Him, to be provoked by Him, to be assured by Him, to hear Him. 
It is perfect. It is sure. It's right. It is pure. It is clean. It is true. He's, he's grappling for words to say, look, these things don't apply to the planets. As majestic as they are, but this, you, you can't hold a planet in your hand. You can hold his word on your lap. And he will shout to you through it. And as you read it, it begins to revive your soul and make wise the simple and rejoice your heart and enlighten, illumine your eyes. It's enduring forever. It will never change. Even if a star burns out, this will never burn out. Even if a star explodes and does whatever stars do, this will never explode. This will endure forever. The book is perfect and true and right. And notice the phrase, of the Lord, of the Lord, of the Lord. These aren't the words of men. These aren't the words of wise people. These aren't the words of David. He's drawing God's people's, God's people's eyes to the word of the Lord, the one who strung the stars in place, now has spoken through millennia using human beings to communicate his words and wisdom and thought and revelation so that now what we have in our possession is all that we need to know him and to understand him. This book reveals what the creator of the universe is like. This book reveals why man is so corrupt in his heart and why societies are so broken down. This book reveals what God did to rescue what he created and loved and called very good. Now, notice the phrase in verse 10. <clears throat> Worth more than much fine gold. Now, let's not read over that too quickly because that is a confrontative point that David inserts purposely. Let's say you, and I don't know what your convenience stores are here in Phoenix. They were Circle K. Uh, I don't know if you have Circle Ks here. Let's just say Shell Gas Station, okay? You go to Shell Gas Station. You're the next guy in line. Now, you have to imagine this. The person serving you has two things on the counter. One is a lottery ticket that he says, this is the winning lottery ticket, and it is worth $310 million. Guaranteed, this is the winning one. And next to it is the only Bible on the planet. There's no Bible software. There's no Bible web pages. There, there's no Bible links. Everything in the world is just the same. The Redskins are going to beat Dallas again this year. Um, food is the same. Weather's the same. The only difference is this. There is only one Bible on the planet. It's right here. And you have a choice. You turn around, and there's a guy behind you holding a Budweiser and a chili dog, and you know the moment you leave, if you don't take that lottery ticket, it's gone. Which do you choose? The $300 million, $10 million guaranteed lottery ticket or the only Bible on earth? Well, see, we're Christians here, so we know the answer. You're not going to fool me. I know a trick question when I hear it. See, SC stands for super Christian. I know the right answer. Here's the question that David is pursuing, though. Why? Why is the Bible the right answer? Why would it be better for you to take the only Bible on the planet rather than the lottery ticket of three... Just think of what you could do for $310 million. Season tickets to whatever team you like. Condo at the beach. 
mansion, put a Bentley in the garage, and you haven't even touched your net worth yet. To forsake all of that for a Bible? Why? Why do that? Well, David answers the question in the verse. For by it you are warned. Gold does not warn. Gold says, enjoy now. Gold says, spend now. Gold says, think of all the happiness you can have in this life now. And the Bible warns and reminds us not to put our hopes in gold. And it warns us that the pleasures of this gold, this earthly gold, will die quickly. It warns us that the moment you cash in that check, that ticket for $310 million, it can happen the very next day. Oh, I never noticed that lump there before. Better go check that out. That wasn't there two days ago. And you go to the doctor and they say, your gold can't do anything. I'm so sorry. And it's over in a week. The second thing it says that it does is that it, keeping the word, there is great reward. What is David doing? He is reminding the readers, look, there is great reward. Not only temporal, like reviving your soul and giving you wisdom and making you wise, but it reminds you it reminds you of a future where you are going, where the streets are made of gold. There is great reward in reading them, not only in terms of daily, day-to-day life, but reminding us of where this all ends. You don't get that from gold. This is what gold says. Eat, drink, be merry. Tomorrow you die. But the word warns and the word assures, ha, ha, I may pass on this ticket and give it to the guy behind me with the chili dog, but I've now got God's very word that I can read every single day and night and be assured that he will speak to me and remind me of the greater rewards that are coming to those who believe. One man said, complaining about God being silent when your Bible is closed is like complaining about not getting texts when your phone is turned off. Open and read. So God speaks through his world. He speaks through his word and he speaks through his work. And there's two parts to that. The first part is the work that David experiences. As he has now been reading God's word, as he's been pondering the greatness of God and the smallness of man, as he's been listening to creation shout out of God's magnitude, as he ponders his word, he goes through some self-reflection. Who can discern his errors? Who can de- declare me innocent of my, of my hidden faults? He's aware of presumptuous sins. That's that's what the Bible does. Self-examination and self-awareness and self-consideration are appropriate responses to beholding God in His power and His holiness and His glory and His love. Those are appropriate responses. See, when a Christian says, I'm going to go read the Bible now, that is a true statement, but it is a half statement. So this morning when I open my Bible or you open your Bible, I say, I'm going to read God's word. That is true, but it is only half true. Because the Christian is to anticipate this. Every time I open the Bible, I will read God's word and it will read me. That's what David is now experiencing as he reflects over the wisdom of God in Scripture, as he reflects over the power of the law in Scripture, he realizes his life is being read. 
And there are areas in his life that are falling short of God's own glory. And he's aware of errors and hidden faults and presumptuous sins. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. Wait, wait. Hand goes up in the back. Now, I, I, thought, I thought you said the word of the Lord revives. It does. But it always reveals before it revives. If you're sitting here this morning, you say, I, I'm feeling pretty good with myself. I don't even feel like I, I need my soul revived. I, I would agree with you. You, you don't. You, you, you need your heart revealed. Because once it is revealed, you will then cry out to God, please revive. That's always the progression. Re- remember, remember Christian in the classic by John Bunyan, The Pilgrim's Progress? Christian wants to go to the celestial city. So he's making his way through this path. He's waking his, making his way to the celestial city. But he's got this burden on his back. And he keeps getting tripped up and sidetracked and stumbling along the way. Because he, he wants to get there, but he's got this giant burden on his back. And finally, he, he runs into worldly wise men. He says, hey, chap, where are you going? Well, I'm trying to get to the celestial city. Well, trip is hard enough, but where did you get that burden on your back? You know you got a burden on your back. Where did you get that burden on your back? Do you remember what Christian said? He said, I got this burden from reading this book in my hands. Because by reading the book, he realized how far short of the glory that he needed to measure up to that he fell. That's what the word is intended to do. I I am aware of how I fall short of the glory of the God of the cosmos by reading this book in my hands. I, I realize I can't stop presumptuous sins in my own power as I read this book in my hands. The very thing I don't want to do, I do. The very thing I don't want to do, I do. The very thing I don't want to do, I, I do and don't do. How, how, where's hope? I find this out by reading the book in my hands. See, David ascribes a classification to the Word of God perfect. Anyone who is not perfect and reads that book will eventually feel the burden. Because you're reading the testimony of someone who has no flaw, no sin, no hidden fault, no presumptuous sin, only perfection. (laughs) Notice he says, errors. John Piper says it's it's a strange word to to translate. He said the best thing he can come up with is baffling sins. There are these just these baffling sins. The Puritans used to call them eruptions of sin. They're not premeditated. They just out and there it is, just this eruption of sin. I'm driving down the road with my wife. And this has happened, unfortunately, on a number of occasions. And someone dangerously cuts me off. Hey, what the? And Janice says, dear, what did you just say? Um, practicing French. Parlez-vous français? Uh, that didn't sound like French to me. Uh, speaking to Deutsch? <laughs> dear, what did you just say? Sweetheart, your, your phone's ringing. Uh, No, it's not. Okay, then call somebody. You're distracting me from being a conscientious and careful driver. Well, see, that never happens to you. Except when there's a bad call against your team and the play. What the? Get rid of this ref. You have a romantic evening and dinner waiting for your husband? Fix this favorite meal? 
in the midst of chaos and kids and all that went on just to him, to honor him. 15 minutes before he's supposed to come home, he calls and says, I'm so sorry, dear. I'm not done with this report. I, I won't be able to make it home for dinner. Something rise up? Hidden faults. You're a young mother with young children. And you're in a play group with other young children. And, and one of the ladies is talking about how her two and a half year old has taught herself how to read, reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> and then it's your turn to share. Well, my, my two and a half still is just eating the erasers. <laughs> and you're tempted to, why doesn't God speak? How come that kid is teaching itself three foreign languages by three? And my kid keeps eating the erasers. Hidden faults become unhidden. One man said, the more diligently someone examines himself in light of Scripture, the more readily he will acknowledge with David that if God would discover our secret faults, there would be found in us an abyss of sin so great as to have neither bottom nor shore. I, I love what 18th century uh, Baptist preacher, he was a pe- preacher in the 1800s, Charles Spurgeon, what his thoughts were in this matter. He said the following, Do not think it a strange thing when people speak all kinds of ill about you. Remember, you are far worse than they suppose you to be. (laughs) Errors, hidden faults, and presumptuous sins. Sins that we commit with eyes wide open. Presumptuous sins, they don't catch us by surprise like hidden faults. We do it ignoring our conscience and ignoring the speaking of of the God of the universe and the warnings of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what temptation is? Let me give you a temptation, a definition of temptation. Temptation is every temptation is a lie wrapped in a promise of happiness. Every temptation is a lie wrapped in a promise of happiness. And how often we presumptuously give in to that lie, assuming it delivers happiness, and it doesn't. God speaks through his world. God speaks through his word. God speaks through the convicting work, as David experienced. And finally, God speaks through the work of Christ. Notice verse 14. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As he has contemplated God's glory in creation, as he's contemplated the even more splendorous glory of God in his word, as he's experienced the conviction of his own heart as he compares the perfect God as as his imperfect life, he has nowhere but to fall but to, O Lord, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. By rock, he's meaning God, immovable, unpersuadable, our provision in need, our shelter in the storms of daily life, that which never moves, that is not shaken, that which we can trust and cling to no matter what we go through, and our Redeemer, our Redeemer. If you are a Christian here this morning, you've experienced the new birth, your Redeemer lives, someone has redeemed your life. This, this is a ledger. Okay, this is a journal, but let's pretend it's a, it's a financial ledger. And it has your name on it. Steve. John. Mary. Frank. Whatever your name is. Your name is on there. And what is in it is every foul thought, every foul desire, Every foul deed, every vulgar word, every presumptuous sin, every sinful thought, every violation of God's law that you have ever committed, it's all accumulated right here. Every one of them written down. And now I'm going to open it and I'm going to read it 
allowed. Now, if that were me, that would be a great time for me to get a phone message. Oh, I got to go. And I'd be hightailing it out the back door. And so would you. But what did David mean when he said, my redeemer? Do you know what he means? This is what he means. When that book is opened, there is one strange word written in it. Your your ledger, sir, your ledger, Mark, my ledger. As that book is opened, there is one word that most theologians say is the most important word in the entire Bible. I'm going to teach it to you. It's a strange word. It's tetelestai. <clears throat> so you open my ledger, open up your ledger, and there's one word, tetelestai. Do you know what that means? Paid in full. That's the word that Jesus uttered on the cross. It is finished. We needed three words. It is finished. He uttered one. Tetelestai. So as I begin to open my ledger, as I begin to open John Payne's ledger, I begin to open your ledger, this is what you begin to see. You begin to think, wait a minute, everything I've ever done is going to be read in public? No, this is what is read in public. Your sins have already been forgiven. Your sins have already been forgiven. Your sins have already been punished. Your sins are no longer recorded here. Your sins have already been paid for. Your sins have already been removed from this ledger and replaced with Jesus' perfect righteousness. Your debt has already been paid in full. There is no debt here. Your guilt has already been pardoned. Jesus has already been scourged for your sins. Jesus has already been humiliated and shamed for your sins. Jesus has already been utterly forsaken by his Father for your sins. Jesus has already faced the Father's horrific wrath for your sins. Jesus has already been tortured for your sins. Jesus has already risen from the dead, demonstrating he has already satisfied the penalty for all your sins. Your sins have already been replaced with perfect righteousness. Your sins have already been placed with an alien, perfect obedience. Your sins have already been buried into the depths of the sea, never to be counted against you. Your, the sin's power has already been broken in your life. That is what is in your ledger. Why? Because you have a Redeemer. That's how David ended this psalm. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So, back to where we began. God is always speaking. Why did he not heal your son? I, I don't know. Why didn't you get the promotion? Why didn't he just send the word? and cause it to be. I I don't know. As I was reflecting over this sermon this morning, I I had flashbacks of my early pastoral ministry because I knew that context and John was here and it took me back to the high school that we spoke in or the junior high. and, And I remember as a young pastor and when I got to this part of the message, I, I thought, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I wish I had the humility and experience when I was a young pastor to say, I don't know a lot more than I did. There are some things that don't have an answer. It doesn't mean I wouldn't share what I do know, but I don't have necessarily an answer for this situation. But even with your prayer not being answered as you desire, This we know. God is constantly speaking through what he has built to assure you of his power and his glory and his sovereign rule. He is constantly speaking through this book 
that he inspired so you can know him, that you can know yourself, and that you can draw near to him and find a reviving of your soul. And he is constantly speaking through his son on the cross as your redeemer. Your sins have already been forgiven. So, the God who sometimes we wish would just cough is coughing constantly. Open your Bible and read. Go to the cross and see. Go out at night at night and marvel. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are a communicating, speaking, revealing God. And Lord, I pray for the individuals right here this morning that need particular assurance of your awareness, your nearness, your understanding of their situation. And Lord, that you would assure them, that you would speak to them. You are the God who continues to speak day and night. It all proclaims your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.